I invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We will be looking at chapter 11. And we will be reading what I think is perhaps the most avoided scripture in the entire Bible, especially when it comes to humanistic Christianity. This particular scripture, verses 1 through 16 of chapter 11, speaks specifically about man's place and woman's place in relationship to God. And it is difficult to swallow, but it has for us a meaning and an understanding that if we embrace it, will give us a sense of identity I believe in the Trinity and the Trinitarian community of God. And so I believe it important. I also believe that if I should continue to avoid it, it would not be responsible of me. I did not pick this so that I could confront it, but I picked it because the Lord laid it on my heart. And so let us read, starting at verse 1. Follow my example, Paul says, as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well shave her hair off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for the man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, the, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is for her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Okay. Wow. Yuck. Let's just skip that and let's go on to happy scriptures, okay? Let's, no. We do have to confront this, don't we? Okay, let us first of all talk about some of the cultural references here that we may not otherwise understand, okay? The church in Corinth was in a town where the temple of Aphrodite was. Now, the t now if you don't know who Aphrodite is, she is the goddess of love, okay? Now, the goddess of love had priestesses, and those priestesses that would be female priests, would cut their hair off and shave their heads bald because they were concerned 
that if they were if they had long hair they might be more beautiful than Aphrodite and if they were more beautiful than Aphrodite it would be a blasphemy or a sacrilege to her and so they would shave their heads bald now in order for you to connect with Aphrodite if you were one of her worshipers you connected with one of her priestesses in what we would call a, a temple prostitution okay now in in the worship of the Lord if you offered food to the Lord this means our Lord if you offered food to him the priest would eat the food in a spot where you could see them so that you would know that your offering had been accepted by God okay so it was not uncommon for similar kinds of practices to occur in pagan religions and so in this pagan religion the way that you would know that Aphrodite had accepted your gift would be then that you would go in with one of the temple prostitutes now the temple prostitutes walking about they were known because their heads were shaved not only were they known by their shaved heads but those who were leaving the priesthood and going back to normal life their hair would be short because it had not yet grown out and so when Paul writes to the church in Corinth and talks to the women about having the covering upon their head he speaks of hair length now there have been those and, and I think we still have have groups of people that uh, where the women carry an extra little covering for the top of their head as a symbol of the authority of God on upon their lives and I, and I won't disrespect that uh, if people want to do that if that's how they feel that they're showing respect to the Lord that is absolutely fine with me but according to the scripture it is the hair that uh, that Paul is talking about because he, he says towards the end he says if a man has long hair that's a covering for his head that it's considered to be a, a shame or a disgrace for him but if a woman has long hair it's considered glory and it's considered wonderful now this is this is not at all a discussion about hair length okay we don't live in Corinth we don't have temple prostitutes and when somebody sees a woman with short hair these days unless it's really butch or something uh, why we don't think twice about it okay now when I say butch I mean you know so close down that that uh, it looks like they have either recovering from from uh, cancer or or have a different opinion about their own sexuality but um, but uh, these days though we're not talking about hair length what we are talking about is the covering okay now that's that's a cultural thing and I needed to lay that out I don't believe that it's intended for us to carry that into our modern culture but there are some things here that do stand as universal principles and we have to confront them and talk about them now at first I want us to remember this statement again until a person meets his responsibilities he has no part in the reward for a job well done that carries into your personal relationship with Jesus it carries into your corporate relationship as the church to Christ but it also carries into your family relationships okay if we are not meeting those responsibilities we don't have an expectation to share in the benefits I want us to just keep that in mind we've already gone over it a couple of weeks so we're not going to belabor it a little bit of review up at the top we have the Trinity in heaven now this Trinity is the Trinity that every other Trinitarian uh, unit that the Bible talks about is based off of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit are in complete unity 
there is no difficulty between them at all. They are not in competition. They are not struggling at all. They are completely unified and at peace. But we are created in his image. And we, because of our sin, are literally in conflict and confusion. Our mind fights with our soul. Our soul fights with our mind. Our body tries to, tries to uh, tell the other two what they can and can't do, should and shouldn't do. We are a mess. We are poison. As people, we are poison in comparison to the perfect trinity of God. And we, you can sit there as long as you want and you can think to yourself, no, I'm not poison. I'm not poison. I know I'm in. Listen, you are either low level poison or you are potent poison, but you are poison. Some poisons work very, very slowly over long periods of time. Other poisons will kill you right off the spot, but poison is still poison. And some people are slow working. Other people are very violent poison that will kill you right on the spot. As individual Christians on our own, we're still a mess, but in Christ, we become complete as part of his church. This means that when we are joined to Christ and there's a little arrow here, I don't think you can see it very well. I can see it from here, but there's an arrow between the two. When we put on the mind of Christ and we subject our mind to his, then soul and body have to follow along. Okay, they have to. So you and I, having become Christians, the flesh has not changed, but the spirit has come. And the spirit having come you have a choice now as a new creature in Christ to make that choice every day. Am I going to follow the spirit or am I going to follow the flesh? And you must make that choice every day in every decision, at every moment. Eventually, if you answer the spirit long enough, the Bible says you will starve the flesh and you can literally starve the flesh almost to death. To the point at which you have crucified, the Bible says, the flesh with its works and now live wholly by the spirit. It is possible, but you've got to starve the flesh in order to do it. That is the sin nature, that part of you that is poison no matter what you do. So the responsibilities as a Christian, just running through these one more time. As a Christian, you need to be born again, regenerated. That means you need to seek it out. You can't be born again on your own. You can't do it by yourself. You can't regenerate yourself, but you need to seek it out. God can do this with you, but you've got to want to be a new creature badly enough that you seek it out. Repent and turn from sin. That is what we just talked about. Listen to the spirit and do what the spirit says. Don't do what the flesh says. Live to the ends of glorifying God. Ask yourself, am I glorifying God with this? This decision that I'm making, this choice that I'm making, this life that I'm living, these things that I'm doing, are they glorifying God? Now, as the church, we need to identify with Christ. That means join him outside of the camp. In other words, let go of society. John says, don't love this world or anything in this world. That if somebody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, so the Bible is pretty specific about that. So we need to join him outside of the camp. Then we need to deny ourselves. Okay, that goes back to, you know, uh, walk by the Spirit, don't walk by the flesh. Be separate, yet connected. Okay, we are from heaven now. If you have been regenerated, you are now from heaven. You are no longer from this earth. Start thinking as a heavenly being. Stop thinking as an earthly being. An earthly being wants, is at home in the earth. An earthly being uh, has goals with regards to this earth. An earthly being thinks about this earth 
as the riches that they want, the riches they're going to have. A heavenly being knows that he has riches stored up for him, treasures in heaven. A heavenly being knows that the, that the morals and the ways of this world are not the morals and the ways of their home. And we are sojourners and aliens looking to get home. And we are not home. We are in a strange land now. What used to be your home is no longer your home. It's a strange land. And so we have to put on the mind of Christ. I know I'm laying a lot on you, but we've been doing stringing this out for three weeks now. So I'm hoping that by repeating this, I'm actually am helping. Okay, so the Christian family trinity, is there such a thing? That's the first question on my mind. Well, is there any such thing as the Trinity of God? Well, the Bible never uses the word Trinity, ever. In the entire Bible, the word Trinity does not exist. Trinity is a word that we have designed to explain what the Bible gives us evidence for. Okay, we have evidence for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see them all operating separately from each other, yet in unity with each other throughout the Bible. We know that we are mind, body, and soul. You and I can easily take a look at our own lives and we can see that that's true. A person's body may go out, a person may have a bad soul, but a great mind. A person may, may have a, a rotten body and a bad mind, but a wonderful soul. We know all of these things that we've talked about. But this scripture, as we have read it, it either describes to us the thing that makes most people uh, cringe or it is trying to tell us something and we are misunderstanding it because we're reading it through a modern humanistic filter. Okay, now at the surface it looks like this. It looks like Christ is at the top. Of course, he answers to the Father and Paul points that out in the scripture. But below Christ, it says that the man is the next in charge. It seems to be saying that. And as we read, it says the man is the image of Christ, but the woman below the man is the image of the man. And so this is the model that it seems to be presenting to us. Not, not a Trinitarian model, but a, an a order of command that puts the woman at the bottom of the heap and creates a hierarchy in which the woman is the least capable and the most helpless. But if you continue to read the scripture, and not stay there, you find that Paul is not saying this exclusively. He's saying this is a part of the puzzle. But Paul tells us clearly, each of us has a single people. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If a woman stays single, then she has a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's no man in between her and the relationship, right? We know that from Scripture. We know from Scripture the man has a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if he's single, then he has no, no woman that he has to be responsible for. So as single people, the man and the woman have relationships with Jesus Christ. Now, is it two different Jesus Christ that they have a relationship with or the same Jesus Christ? It's the same Jesus Christ. So we're going to put this together a little bit more for you because Paul says in the scripture, remember this and don't get proud because while the woman came from the man, God turned the tables so that the only way that a man can come into this world is through a woman. 
And by stating this, Paul is saying that the woman and the man are equalized. The man, because of creation, is over the woman, but the woman, because of recreation, is over the man. And so the two are equalized. So we see that the man and the woman are on an equal plane so long as they are single and they are on an equal plane so long as they are in Christ. But what if they decide to build a family? If they decide to build a family, and you can see maybe down here in the bottom corners, we have two red triangles, okay? This is because the flesh is always there. And as great as my relationship with God is these days, I could simply go back to doing the things of the flesh. I could resurrect that flesh. I could give a revival to that flesh and I could become a horrible individual and reveal just what poison I really am. It's the same with all of us. Same with all of us. At the top of this trinity, we have the relationship with Christ. Both the man and the woman have a relationship, we just said, with the same Jesus, right? So it is right and good that we should put Jesus at the top of this family trinity. But we also have the man. The Bible says clearly, the man is the manifestation of Christ, the image of Christ in the home. It says clearly, doesn't it? We just read it. But we know that the man is not superior to the woman because the scripture made it clear. That even though woman came from man in creation, that in recreation, man must come from woman. So we must draw a parallel line between the two while we have vertical lines that connect us to Christ. And this brings us to the woman. She must be put in a place to where she is covered by the man because the Bible tells us she is covered by the man. And she must be put in a position where she is covered by Christ because the Bible tells us she is covered in her relationship to Jesus Christ. This puts her in one spot in the Trinity where all of those things are satisfied. Now, if you recall the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you can recall the Trinity of the mind, the soul, and the body. You will recall that here in the family relationship, in the family Trinity, we have Christ at the head of the Christian family. Christ is not the head of a non-Christian family. In a non-Christian family, cut this out and you've got two poison people competing with each other for their entire marriage as to which poisoned person is going to be less poison to the marriage relationship. Or they might be two poisoned people that manage to find each other and manage to agree that they both love each other's poison. But they're poisoned nonetheless. And you say, well, what about non-Christian marriages that survive until death do, the, do them part? That's because they've managed to find a compromise somewhere in their marriage that has worked for them. So I'm not saying it's impossible to have a, a successful marriage without Christ. But what I am saying is if you want to have a Christian marriage, it is going to be a Trinitarian marriage where Christ is the head, the mind of the marriage, the thinker of the marriage, the, the one who gives us the information. The man is going to be the manifestation of the home. And his character, his accomplishments, 
they are going to mark the home no matter what, no matter how you organize things. But the woman, not, not subordinate to the man, but the woman equal to the man, yet submissive to the man, becomes in the place of the soul of the home, the spirit of the home. Go and take a look at your home where your mom and dad are intact or where even mom has passed away and dad is still alive. You will not see on those walls all of the evidence of dad. You will see on those walls, in those pictures, in those frames, you will see in the choice of furniture, the choice of design, you will see in all of that mom. Mom is all over that house. She is the soul of that house. Oh, dad might have a little, little man cave off to the side somewhere. But your house, the soul of your house is mom. Now, since she holds the place in this family trinity, where the Holy Spirit holds the place in the trinity of God, there is an honor due to mom that is greatly missed. And because the man holds the place of Christ in the family trinity, there is an honor due the man that is greatly missed. But there are also responsibilities that if we are trying to build Christian family without Christ, those responsibilities not met will ruin even a Christian marriage. Because dismissing Christ, even in a moment, even for a season, leaves us with two poisoned people competing for who is going to have dominance in the home. If you would treat the Holy Spirit the way you treat your wife, would you have a good relationship with God, husbands? Women, if you treated Christ the way you treat your husband, would you and Christ have a good relationship? I'm not going to tell you beyond this any detail, but I want you to weigh that out. Because we have enough evidence in 1 Corinthians 11, combined with the rest of the scripture that talks about the relationships between the man and the woman and Christ, that this is a valid question. If you would cut down and humiliate the Holy Spirit and expect the Holy Spirit to still have a good relationship with you, by all means, gentlemen, continue to do that to your wife. If you would call Christ an idiot, a moron, and poke fun at him because he doesn't do things the way you do them, ladies, and you think you could have a good relationship with Christ doing that, by all means, then go ahead. But if we are going to have real Christian family, there must be real Christian unity within that family. And the mother and the wife must be respected with the same importance to the family trinity that the Holy Spirit or your soul has to do with the other Trinitarian forms. And if you're going to have a happy home, the husband or the father must be treated with the same respect that Christ or your body would be treated with in the other two Trinitarian forms. But above all, 
Christ should be respected in accordance with the respect you would give the Father. You take this model, apply it to your home, apply it to your marriage, apply it to the way you do things from here on out. You will have a happy home. The divorce rate in the Christian church will go down to practically zero. I say practically zero because we are still de dealing with two poisoned people that may from time to time not honor. But if this is our reality and we're bucking that reality, we're ruining our families. So, Christian family responsibilities, both of you submit to Christ as the head of all. The man, manifest Christ. Now, how do you manifest Christ? You manifest him by not getting in his way. You ask him to manifest, and then you get out of the way. Okay, so in that much, you are responsible. The woman manifests the spirit. Woman, how do you manifest the spirit of God? By asking the spirit to manifest through you and then getting out of the way. These are the responsibilities of the home, of the Christian family home. Now, if you're scribbling them down, I'm going to give you just about a second there. I'm using the word manifest today, and I want us to think about what's coming up next week. And it is here already. And that's the spring campaign. We are going to be talking about manifesting God within the church and within the community. We are not going to be talking about forcing it or pretending, but we're going to be talking about asking him and getting out of the way. So this this just continues to flow and to follow because God is the one giving us these messages. This was a very difficult message for me. I asked the Lord, please, is there any other message? Please, some other message, please. I don't think, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I don't know if this is the right thing to do. And the Lord said, do it. And he, so here I am. Moving on. Don't forget this. Until a person meets his responsibilities, he has no part in the reward for a job well done. You want a happy home and a happy family. Don't just be two poisoned people that are compromising on how you're going to satisfy each other's poison. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and manifest those parts of the Trinity that God has called you to manifest so that there might be unity and peace in your home, even as there is unity and peace in the heavenly trinity.